this video, we're going to talk about fracture or deformation of brittle rocks. As we have discussed, brittle rocks tend to fracture when placed under a high enough stress. Such fracturing, while it does produce irregular cracks in the rock, sometimes produce planar features that provide evidence of the stresses acting at the time of formation of the cracks. There are two major types of more or less planar structures or fractures can occur. We have the joints and faults. So we will discuss them one by one. I feel like I need to take notes or something. Like, let me get my whiteboard out and just start writing this shit down and be like, oh. We have studied in our discussion of physical weathering that joints are fractures in rock that show no slippage or offset along the fracture. They are usually planar features, so their orientation can be described as strike and dip. They form as a result of extensional stress acting on brittle rock. Again, extensional stress. Such stresses can be induced by cooling of rock, meaning volume decreases as temperature decreases, or by relief of pressure, as rock is eroded above, thus removing weight. So joints provide pathways for water and thus pathways for chemical weathering attack. Because joints provide access of water to rock, rates of weathering and or erosion are usually higher along joints and this can lead to differential erosion. If new minerals are precipitated from water flowing in the joints, this will form a vein. So many veins observed in rock are mostly quartz or calcite. So joints happen when brittle rocks fracture and there is an offset along the fracture. When the offset is small, the displacement can easily be measured. But sometimes, the displacement is so large that it is difficult to measure. Now, there are different types of faults. Faults can be divided into several different types depending on the direction of relative displacement. Since faults are planar features, the concept of strike and dip also applies. Nobody saw this coming. And thus, the strike and dip of fault plane can be measured. So we have first the dip-slip faults. Here, the displacement is measured along the dip direction of the fault. Next, we have the strike-slip faults where the displacement is horizontal parallel to the strike of fault. Again, Dip-slip faults have an inclined fault plane and along which the relative displacement or offset has occurred along the dip direction. Note that in looking at the displacement on any fault, we don't know which side actually moved or if both sides moved. All we can determine is the relative sense of motion. Now we have two different types of dip-slip faults. First is the normal fault. It results from horizontal tensional stresses in brittle rocks and where the hanging wall block has moved down relative to the foot wall block. So it looks like this. So again, normal faults, tension. Due to the tensional stress responsible for normal faults, they often occur in a series with adjacent faults dipping in opposite direction. In such a case, the down dropped blocks from grabbins and the uplifted blocks from horses. In areas where tensional stress has recently affected the crust, the grabbins may form rift valleys and the uplifted horse blocks may form linear mountain ranges. A normal fault that has a curved fault plane with a dip decreasing with depth can cause the drop down block to rotate. So this will form a half graben. So this is because it is bounded by only one fault instead of the two that form a normal graben. Next, we have the reverse faults. Reverse faults result from horizontal compressional stresses in brittle rocks, where the hanging wall block has moved up relative to the foot wall block. So as you can see here in the picture. Under the reverse fault, we have the thrust fault. It is a special case of a reverse fault where the dip of the fault is less than 45 degrees. Thrust faults can have considerable displacement measuring hundreds of kilometers and can result in older strata overlying younger strata. I don't understand. I don't understand, bitch. I don't understand. 
Another is the strike slip faults. These are faults where the relative motion on the fault has taken place along a horizontal direction. It results from shear stresses acting in the crust. So reverse fault, normally compressional. Strike slip faults, shear stress. Now, if the block on the other side has moved to the left, the fault is lateral strike slip. Now, if the block on the other side has moved to the right, then it will be called right lateral strike slip fault. So again, strike slip faults can be of two varieties depending on the sense of displacement, left or right. In the next video, we're going to talk about deformation or fracture of ductal rocks. You will never see my face again. Goodbye. <laughs> you guys.